Welcome to Magnet Marketers, our weekly live show where we break down the head, heart, and hand approach to building sustainable growth in your business. During each episode, we share actual client marketing best practice examples, strategies, and tactics that will help you generate real results. Our belief? A magnet always works better than being a bullhorn to attract, retain, and build your brand. Ready to dive into this week's Relationship Marketing Training Tuesday? Well, let's get started. Here's your host, Mike Ingrich and Jessica Phillips. Yay. Hello, hello, and welcome to Magnet Marketers this Training Tuesday Live. We're super pumped to be diving into all things content today with one of the content queens herself, Melanie Diesel. Super pumped to talk about how you can generate unlimited story ideas and ideas using content fuel framework, which we'll dive into here in just a moment. But before I introduce our special guest today, if we've not met before, hello, hello. My name is Jessica Phillips with Now Marketing Group and the Relationship Marketing System. My personal mission is to help others love more, give more, and be more through the art of authentic relating. We just happen to use some relationship marketing tactics to do so. And my awesome co-host, he's Mike Ingrich. He was just fixing his hair a little bit ago in the background, as you could uh, maybe read on the screen if you were watching that countdown timer. But he's president of a web development and software firm, Digital Hill Multimedia, published author extraordinaire five times over, triathlete, runner, biker, and leading business blogger at MikeIngrich.com. How's it going, Mike? Hey, doing well and uh, yeah, excited for today. So uh, just excited to have Melanie with us. So um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna jump in because uh, we, we got to get to this, right? Okay, so uh, let me let me give you a little background on uh, Melanie Diesel here for us. So Melanie is a, a keynote speaker, uh, author, award-winning branding content creator and lifelong storyteller. Hang on to that word, it's gonna come up again. She's on a mission to share the power of compelling incredible content with others. She's the director of content at Foundation marketing and author best-selling marketing and business communications book the content fuel framework which we're going to talk about today how to generate unlimited story ideas uh, prior to the work with foundation she was the chief content officer of story fuel and the first editor of brand content at the new york times welcome melanie Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to see you all. It's been a while. I know, Jessica, I don't even remember the last time we saw each other no. at this point. It's been a minute. I've been getting like all the Facebook alerts with like the memories that pop up. And I'm sure yeah. all of you have as well, like all those memories that pop up on your phone when we get to get close with humans and actually hug them and, and have these beautiful stories that we were living. And then it was easier to tell, right? Like uh, I'm excited for things that are opening back up for all of us to have those moments again and where I can see you in person again, Melanie, because no. it's been a minute. But I oh, know, I can't wait. <laughs> and I'm so excited you just started a new job. So I definitely wanna dive into that and just kind of your story overall. But as we dive in, if you're watching where this with us live, let us know first how you, you're doing, where you're joining in from, and how you've been telling some stories, maybe uh, using just what's going on in your daily life. Like what's your struggle with telling stories? What's your superpower with telling stories? Just drop it in the comments. And if nothing else, just let us know where you're watching from as we dive in with our content expert here, Melanie Diesel. So Melanie, for those that don't know you, I know I've got to see you speak. I'm like a fangirl of your work, both <laughs> watching you talk about it and actually putting it into action as well. So you're someone that walks the walk, but I would love for you to share just a little bit of your story and how you come become so passionate about content and storytelling. Yeah. So my background is actually journalism. So I never studied marketing. I never thought I would end up in marketing. Um, I was obsessed with journalism, like editor of my, my high school paper, my college paper. Like I was all about uh, journalism. Uh, but I found that I, I wasn't able to find the kind of jobs that I had been trained for by the time I graduated. You know, so much of the technology had changed between what I learned and then the world that I was graduating into. And so I was looking to figure out where can I take all these skills that I've amassed about how to talk to people and, and interview them efficiently and, and tell stories based on assignment and switch my my writing voice from publication to publication and think in all these different formats. How can I put that to use? if a newsroom is not gonna be the place for me. And so that's sort of the roundabout way about how I ended up in content marketing. 
And I always give credit. It was actually a very savvy recruiter uh, from the Huffington Post who uh, you know, had talked to me about a, an editorial position and said, hey, actually, we have an opening on our marketing team that might be a good fit for you. Um, we weren't really talking about like content marketing at this point. Um, I was called like an, an ad product manager and my product was content. It was a different time. Um, but really, I was a content strategist. I mean, that's what I was doing. And so, uh, you know, I always thought, to be honest, at first, like, I'll do this for a little while until I can get into journalism. Right. And I very quickly found that uh, I actually love being able to work in marketing because I could take everything that I loved about journalism, everything that drew me to it and share all of that with others. Um, so that's that's really been my mission. It's it's very impact and, and education oriented. I wanna take all those tips and tricks and tools and the things that I know are so powerful about good storytelling and, and share it with marketers so that hopefully together we can raise the bar and you know create content that, that changes culture and, and makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Huffington Post people like, not a first gig. I'm like, I worked at Fazoli's uh, doing some breadsticks, playing in for a minute. And then, you know, big girl job, Verizon. She's like, oh, you know, college paper, Huffington Post. <laughs> yeah, this is her skill set. So I love the one thing that you mentioned there, storytelling, right? Like, I think that's the, the word that really we need to focus on when it comes to content, because that's the art of being able to take something that's helpful or educational or what have you, and being able to transform it into a story helps people remember it. And I yeah. think that's been a hard thing for brands maybe to grasp because they're, they're like, okay, you're, you're told you need to do social media posts, right? Now you need to blog. Now you need to put all this stuff out. So they're so busy with the doing and pushing things yeah. out that it's hard to stop and pause and say, okay, is it, do I need to just do more? Is that why it's not working for me? Or what is it? I mean, what have you found that's like the struggles for brands, maybe the do's and don'ts that yeah. really have hindered them with content? I mean, there's a couple of really common things. One of them is what you just hinted at, which is this immense pressure to do everything and be everywhere. You have to sort of be omnipresent. Somehow you're supposed to be doing live and having a podcast and making engaging TikToks and also updating your blog every day, but also updating YouTube, you know, and then somehow actually running your company somewhere in the middle there. Um, and that's, I mean, that creates a lot of overwhelm. I know for a lot of, especially small businesses, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, you know, like we're only human, we're only one person. And in so many cases, we're comparing ourselves to either large enterprises that have a 20 person team doing what we're trying to do ourselves, uh, or these like major influencers and experts who, again, behind the scenes, they're not doing every post themselves. Yeah. They're not researching their own hashtags. They're not posting these things manually. So we're sort of measuring ourselves up against a false reality. And so there's that pressure of trying to do everything. And then the opposite uh, is actually sort of the other common problem, which is I see all of that happening, all of that overwhelm, all of those platforms, and I can't do that. So I'm just going to totally shut down. I'm just going to post nothing. I didn't even try. I've never even gone on any of these platforms. I, I'm not a social media person or I'm not a content person. Um, and we just sort of like build a wall. Um, and I, so a lot of my work is kind of trying to push people toward the middle and say, what we can do, what's within our power is to define what's realistic for our resources, for our audience, and find a way we could focus our efforts and do what we can with what we have and have it make the most difference, the biggest impact possible. Uh, so I think like either end of that extreme is probably where a lot of folks fall, especially if this isn't their background. I mean, that's another thing that I think we don't give enough attention to is most of us got into the business we're in uh, because we love that business, right? We love, uh, you know, taking care of animals or or slinging breadsticks, right? Like there's something we love about the business we're in. Um, and many of us weren't initially trained to be podcast producers and video editors and, you know, all these other things. And now suddenly that's your job with no training, no warning. You're just supposed to know all these things. So I, I try to be aggressively uh, pragmatic and realistic about these things. Like we're we're only human. So let's just try to do our best and focus on the things that make the biggest difference for us. Good, good. And, and I mean, can we dive into some of those things on a, you know, yeah. when, when you kind of are, when you're talking about the book here, what's um, maybe kind of lay out a little bit of uh, where do you start? 
Sure. So the, the biggest thing I think is actually a mindset shift. So when you look at the way journalists approach content, we are never thinking about the format first, right? Which is something we do in marketing. I need a TikTok idea or I need a YouTube idea, right? We start with the with the the finished product without knowing what the ingredients even are. So it's that mindset mindset shift to say, um, you know, I'm going to focus on what my story is about, the message, the story, what am I actually trying to say and accomplish? And once I know that, then we can go ahead and think about what's the best way to bring this to life. So that's a lot of what the intro to the book is about, just kind of helping people shift that mindset and realize that your content will perform so much better if you really focus on the message, the story, what am I trying to say and how am I gonna say it, then think about the best way to bring it to life. So we start there and then what we do is just break down a bunch of different approaches, a bunch of different formats to kind of give you uh, all the tools in your toolbox to, to make whatever it is you decide you need to make. Oh my God, I love that first of all. That's really some wise advice that I have not heard before. You speaking it anyway. Like, and something else that you said earlier on us comparing ourselves to the experts that are out there doing the thing every day on doing the thing, meaning talking about their topics, right? And they're out there the yeah. whole day. You see them on Clubhouse now, you know, and you're like, how in the heck? Are they on Clubhouse this much time? Or how are they producing yeah, they this many tweets? And everyone <laughs> see them, right? And, and the other extreme where you don't see anyone that you're like, oh my gosh, you have such a cool story to tell when you meet them. And so I love that you shared in the middle. And I was actually just on a Clubhouse, speaking of it, um, on Sunday with um, Brian Fanzo and Ali Boyd talking about relationship marketing. And Brian said something really cool there where he said, you know what, the best marketers, best fill in the blank um, that I know that are actually doing the thing are the thing are the people that you don't see everywhere and all out in mm -hmm. front of you. Those are the people that are keeping their kind of community together, right? Like they have their most um, powerful community that are surrounding them and they're all they're focusing on instead of the numbers, right? Is like keeping that belonging with that community because they're doing the work yeah. that's producing the ROI. So I love that you also just said, you know, not thinking about the format first, right? Or, or not thinking about like, okay, where's this going to live? What platform, but starting yeah. with what it is, that creativity, yeah. that story, that, that powerful thing that nobody else can own but you. So yeah, like, and it comes back to another journalism, like truism, which I will always do. Sorry, that's it's always going to come back to that. Um, but we are taught show, don't tell. That as journalists, like it's not our job to tell the audience this is a good person or a bad person or a good law or a bad law. It's our job to show them the facts and let them make the decision, right? So we sort of remove ourselves from it. And the goal is demonstrate this and let them decide. And so what you're talking about, we've all seen those people across platforms telling everyone how successful they are, telling everyone how much money they make, telling everyone how great their clients are. And then exact point that you're making. Well, when are you working with these clients? Because you've been on Clubhouse for 17 hours straight. Like, when do you have time to make all this money and do all this work with clients, right? Not to say that we don't believe them, but to your point, Warren Buffett doesn't go around talking about how good he is at managing money. Oprah doesn't go around talking about what a great businesswoman she is. Beyonce doesn't have to tell us that she's great at music and building a musical empire. They're doing it. And so it's so, so much better if you could focus on creating content that demonstrates your expertise instead of spending twice as much time trying to tell everyone what an expert you are. Yes, wonderful. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. Right. It goes back to the magnet versus the bullhorn thing. Sorry, Mike. Yes. Yeah. No, I just thought that really flows well with, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. with kind of the what what I'm leaning from the initial parts of what you've talked about with the book. So, so we've um, um, th we've got to start then. So now we know kind of where we should start, what it comes from. So, how do we, I don't know, re refine that or or you know develop that next. Yeah. So one of the things that um, I tried to do in the book, again, I'm trying to share all the things I learned in journalism. So, um, you know, you never see a newspaper or a website like show up and say, sorry, there's no news today. We couldn't find any story. We couldn't think of anything. Right. Um, but we run into that or we think we run into that challenge a lot as marketers. Like, how can I find a fresh way to talk about this? Like, it's the same product as it was yesterday and last month and last year. Um, so. In the, in the start of the book, I walk through 10 different perspectives you can take on any story. So 
Um, that could be people. So thinking, okay, well, what are the people involved with this message I want to share? Is it the customers or the engineer or the designer? Uh, you know, our vendors, our community partners, there's so many people who are probably involved in that topic. You could take a history approach and say, okay, this is the message I want to share, but you know, what, what got us to here? Can I look back and talk about the past of this particular message or story and sh talk about how we got here? You could take a, a data approach and say, well, what are the numbers? Like, let's straight up just go to the numbers. Let's look at the data, the trends, this, you know, the studies and the research and take a, a purely quantitative approach to this topic. So we give 10 of those perspectives, those different focuses, we call them. So that way that gives you a starting point to say, okay, I know I need to talk about our product launch. Have I talked about the people involved in the launch? Have I talked about the data of, of this mm, product awesome. and how it helps people? Have I talked about, so it gives you like a checklist of different yeah. approaches Take. it keeps things you know feeling a little bit fresh and and hopefully provide some inspiration oh my god i love that so yeah. first of all she's dropping some major wisdom here so if you guys are like holy crap i'm gonna need to rewind and play this back you can do that and you can also type recap in the comments here uh so you can get that info sent directly to your inbox we're going to be creating a blog recap of all melody's tips and also she's been gracious enough to provide a code that she's going to give you in order to be able to you know optimize a lot of these things that she's talking about uh within the story brand or excuse me within the uh, content fuel framework so you know and talking about how you can create some stories with that so um i'll make sure that we drop that in the comments here we'll also include that in the blog but definitely type recap if you want these nuggets that you can get delivered to your inbox because it's a lot of wisdom because I know working with clients, that's the biggest thing that they struggle with. Melanie, like yeah. what you hit on, I'm like, we've already talked about this. This is what we do, especially like a lot of clients I work with, they work in niche of a niche of a niche, <laughs> like a business to where it's not so sexy and glamorous, right? Like, um, you know, I know I, I say this one all the time on here just because I feel like it's a good example, but Mr. Manhole, he literally has a tool that cuts holes in the ground, uh, the repairs manholes. That's and so cool. You know, it's so cool, right? But like, that's exactly it. There's there's people that find things like that cool, but the case studies, right? The, you know, the new things in the industry, like as it changes, interviewing the people that are actually using the tool, like you are spot on and, and then finding out what's the best method of delivering it once you have that story, video, yep. social, right? Like blog. And, and I think that's so powerful to when you can break it down like that, because there's people that are interested in what you have to say, right? Like it doesn't matter if you are tired of hearing it because you live it every day. And just because you said it a year ago, what I'm hearing you saying is that that's okay. You can, you know, present it in another way. Is that right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's, and there's a couple of different things in there that I like to give people, I'm big on analogies because I think sometimes um, when we when we think about our own work, like you said, we don't think it's sexy, we don't think it's interesting. So I find that analogies really help us kind of take an objective view. Um, one of my favorite examples is we have all had that moment, or you know, a child in your life has had the moment at the the mall or the food court where you see either a pretzel maker or a pizza guy tossing the dough and you know making the pretzels, and it's mesmerizing. Now that person does that. 500 times a day and doesn't think it's interesting at all, but it's still really cool to us to watch the dough get tossed or to watch them like, you know, do one slick movement and suddenly the, the rope is a pretzel because we don't know, we don't do it. And so there's a lot of things that our audience, we can create that same kind of feeling of like, this is easy for me, but my audience doesn't know how it works. Like when you said digging manhole, I was like, it never even occurred to me that there's some sort of special tool to cut out manholes and like, Talk to me about the art, what goes on the manhole covers, how to, you know, why is it a circle to begin with? I mean, there's so much interesting fodder there that you could talk about. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say is I have heard the, it doesn't apply to me or my industry is not sexy or my product's not cool. Everyone thinks that their product is special and interesting and not cool and not sexy. Like everyone thinks that because you're in it. You, you don't see the water because you're swimming in it, right? And sometimes it takes that objective view or a checklist to remind you of different ways you can approach it because it is it is hard to see it when you're doing it every day, you know? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, we've got our checklist. Maybe I'm focused on people then. And then, um, so do I do I drill down further then? Do I, do I get to the... Um, you know, kind of the specifics of 
a platform eventually or you know tell me a little bit more about that then yeah so i like to encourage us to to ask the question you know once we know our story i'm going to tell a people focused story about manhole covers we're going there um yes, so you yes. know who's the person who designs the manhole covers and tells us you know what what they have to say and what they look like and how artistic they are so that's the story we're going to tell and then the question we ask is you know what's the best way to bring this story to life so obviously this is a visual story so we're going to want to make sure we choose something that has visuals whether that's photo video live video um, you know, we're going to want to make sure that we can, you know, show that beautiful artwork um, or, or just the process of, of creating those uh, as part of our story. So that limits us to, you know, those few that we mentioned, a, a photo slideshow or video. Or, yeah. or video, live video. Right. So by thinking about once we know the story, it becomes so, so much easier to figure out what are the elements we need in a format that's going to let us bring it to life. So unsurprisingly, we took a similar approach with formats in the book. Uh, and there's sort of a checklist of 10 there with examples and background and and help for for how to explore some of those uh, because I think we kind of get stuck in our own in our own favorite formats like there's mm -hmm. I, I like to say everyone has a first content language there's like a, a type of content that you create most fluently that you're most comfortable communicating in um, and it's really easy to like over rely on that like for me my default's always writing like you want a piece of content from me? You're going to get writing if you don't specify. But for other people, like it might be audio, it might be video, it might be yeah, a quiz, like you know, an infographic. Everyone has that instinct, um, and so you know, I think it's important to have that checklist to kind of get ourselves out of our head a little bit, and and again, like unlock the possibilities that we might not be considering. I love that. And I'm um, cracking up at George's uh, comments here. He was like, the Romans <laughs> made the first manhole cover and here's why it's round and instead of square. And the reason why he knows this is because it's been written on the blog, right? Like, and, <laughs> and also done in videos in different formats, because I, I love that you said that, like, you know, know your first content language, but then think about how people are going to want to see it and experience it. Cause honestly, we've actually repurposed things in a different way. Like maybe be telling kind of that same story, kind of like here, I, I was telling you as we yeah. go on magnet marketers, you know, we're, we're delivering it here first, but then we also do it as a recap and a blog. And then we'll create some smaller nuggets of social posts out of it because just because it's your content language. It doesn't mean that that's where your audience is going to want to consume it. Yeah. And what's cool about it though, what I've seen and like what we're just seeing demonstrated by George here, which is awesome, is that when people are reading it and they're getting an understanding about something that they find interesting, it empowers them to want to share it on more often. Like I think we all enjoy feeling confident in uh, understanding something that we find interesting because then we can be part yeah. of conversation, right? Like, and, and that only helps. That's where that content meets the marketing, meets the sales. And in, in my opinion, it all ties in together, but yeah. it's how you deliver it that makes all the difference, whether people want to participate or not. Yeah, for sure. And this is sort of a separate topic, but I, I mean, they all, it all mushes together. Um, like it also ties into psychology. Like a lot of the reason that people share things, there's very clear data that shows us why people share things. I share something because I want to entertain others or something because it says something about myself. Like, hey, I know this, I'm smart, or I know this person, or I'm an expert in this topic. Uh, we share it because we want to change other people's perception of us. So I want them to think that I'm clever or think that I'm well connected. You know, we share because something touches us emotionally. So when you start to understand that, that can almost be another checklist for you to say, you know, why would someone share this? Does this content that I created give enough reason for someone to share it and, and continue to be a part of the story with us? Excellent. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I love that. Continue to be part of the story with us, like with us. Mm. I think that's cool. Like you're, you're saying like they're with us, not, that's not all about us. Like we're telling this story. And, and as you said earlier, like objectively, like let people make up their own minds. It's not like we're going on and saying manhole covers, like this is the best Supreme tool. I mean, it is, but like, you know, like it's just like, here's it's showing yeah, what it does, right? Telling. Like, and, and telling it from a way of how, here's how it can help you become X, Y, Z in some ways, but then just sharing, sharing what it is and letting people make up their own minds. That's powerful. I love that. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of it is also just recognizing that your audience should be at the center of all the things you do. And I know that you know this, this is what you're all about, Jessica, but you know, it's all about those relationships and understanding, you know, what is it that my audience expects from me? How can I provide value to them? Because again, that's that's really the the KPI, if you will, in journalism. Like we're not incentivized typically by page views or or engaged time on an article. Like that's not how we operate. It's all have I provided value to my audience? Have I addressed the issues and topics that my audience cares about? Have I covered the things you know that my audience wants to learn more about? Have I been a good conduit in that I asked someone the questions that the audience would have asked if they were there to do it themselves. So really putting the audience at the center of all these things that you do, it addresses so many of these things that we talked about. Because you're, if you're operating with your audience's needs at the center instead of your own, you're actually going to get the results that you think putting your own needs at the center would get you. That's a quotable. Whoa, yeah, that's good <laughs> oh. stuff right there. Probably could have quoted it a little better. That was a little, a little bit no, of a, it was perfect. a roundabout. But. <laughs> it was perfect. Now, okay, so these are the some things that the brands the brands can do. And now I'm, you know, I'm imagining people watching this video or when they get your book, you know, and and start diving into this, that they're like, okay, well, maybe I feel stuck. Like, do you encourage them um, to maybe you know ask some of the questions by their team members or their or their um, their customers even like to, to get involved or like what's some of the best practices of, of starting to generate that story now that you yeah. have kind of that idea and, and this second part of that of like any pitfalls to avoid at the same time. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I really encourage people to do is to use those checklists um, like a prompt, because I think the biggest, scariest thing is the I don't have any ideas or I don't know where to start. So yeah. I'll actually show you um, in the book, it's page 17, I believe, we have like a matrix. Um, so we lined up all the focuses and the formats into a grid. So you could sort of pick any intersection and say, well, could I tell the story, a data focused story through video? Oh, that might be interesting. Or, okay, could I tell a, an opinion story through a quiz? Oh, that might be an interesting approach. Um, and I actually have these, uh, I've got these little 10 sided die that I like to use to come up with like a random prompt. Uh, a random focus and format combination. Um, because I just think that so many times we just need our brain to be given a direction. We are yeah. so creative. We come up with a million ways that things could go wrong or you know that that's you know uh, something negative because we are given that prompt. And so if we switch it up and give ourselves a prompt for the positive, we can mm. put our brains to work on coming up with an idea instead of coming up with an excuse or a worst case scenario. Oh, that's so powerful. Okay, guys. Uh, first of all, I think this book is powerful. Um, yeah. I'm excited to get it. And I've not done this here before, but if you comment, I want the book or just, I want it because this is something that speaks to you. And I'm going to put this up for, so anybody that's watching the replay, so I will randomly draw three people on Friday and I will buy the book and ship it to you. So just comment, like, I want the book. I will personally buy it and we will ship it to you. Um, and I'll pick those winners and announce it in this comment threads, plural, because I know we're streaming in a few different places. Um, but I will put everybody in there and draw it for three people to get this book, because I honestly feel like this is the shift. And this is something we've been talking about for the past, well, for a long time, but really hyper focused on for the past year of really, you know, stop putting so much noise out and focus on, and I know people say it all the time, quality over quantity, but truly like looking at the stories, it doesn't have to be so, so much uh, overwhelm that goes into it. And oh my God, what's that specific key word? Yes, you do want SEO. Yes, you do want to continue to show up, um, you know, consistent, consistently, you know, putting out blog content and social content and video and all the different mediums. But it truly, if you want it to make a difference, it has to be uh, the heart of what your purpose is, your story, and have that personality to it that's going to be the difference that makes all the difference for how you're spending your time. So I love how Melanie is now taking, you know, the thing that we've all been talking about, but putting a plan to it. So again, three people randomly on Friday, just comment, I want the book. And we'll pick those people on Friday um, and comment on the threads to let everybody know who won. And then I'll private message you to get your info to, to send it out to you. But it's something I think everybody should read, including myself. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, Thank I you love for that. that grid. 
Yes, I love that grid approach. I mean, that's uh, page 17, right? We, that's uh, that's, that's one. gold right there. <laughs> yeah, and there's actually, um, you know, the, I, I have like a cheat sheet that I use, so I'll just hold it up here and you can see, it's got all the focuses and formats listed out. You could print this off, off my website. So the, the link that we shared for all the printable resources, it's a free resource. So, um, you know, if you just want that checklist, uh, maybe not the grid, but if you want that checklist to kind of run through for yourself, you can get that on the website as well. Now, George yeah. asked, 10-sided dive. Miss Melanie, are you a tabletop gamer? I am a, a tabletop game appropriator <laughs> is what I am. I am not actually a tabletop gamer, but I realize that 10-sided die exists because I have friends who are tabletop gamers. And so I, I sort of appropriated them to my own brainstorming purposes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Beautiful. Yep. Well, as I told you, time flies fast here, you know, when you're diving into the goodies. So <laughs> I want to just uh, finish up. Is anything else that you think is most important for brands to start with or to know? So as their takeaway from here, the first thing that they should be doing or thinking about to get started with being able to tell better stories? If you feel like this is really overwhelming or you may have trouble getting buy-in from someone in your organization, I find that the easiest sort of uh, baby step that you can take is to try to add more narrative to your customer stories or case studies or testimonials, whatever that equivalent is for you. Uh, just explain, everyone's on board with those. We all know testimonials and case studies are good. So if you go to those folks and you say, we know these are working. I'd like to try to optimize them to make them more in depth, to make them more engaging because everybody's behind testimonials and case studies. So then you can go through the checklist and say, well, what if I told this through the data? How much money have we saved them? How much time have we saved them? Uh, you know, you can kind of give yourself these prompts and, and create a more in-depth approach to sharing those stories. That's often the baby step that you need to get buy-in to continue to apply that approach to other areas of the business and other types of content. Beautiful, beautiful. I freaking love this stuff. It's good stuff, people. I'm telling you, like, I love it. And I love how, like, you take everyday moments too and you tie it into the thing that you're trying to say, like, just being a fan of your work. Like I said, um, like, there was one time I sent you a sugar wish and you took the art of that story of the thing that's happening personally in your life right now. And you just asked me a couple questions on, like, what was story wish, yada, yada. But the rest of it was just your story tying into, you know, customer delight and adding delight and, and then using some of the numbers of saying, like, how this works, right? So, like, in yeah. tying that into that overarching story, in tying in personal moments, something that just happened to you to kind of inspire that analogy, metaphor, what have you, you know, Um and, and I think that's, once you get into that zone of doing it, then it becomes more and more comfortable, you know, yeah. of doing that yourself. That's cool. A really fun game to play, this is a little separate, but a really fun game to play is how could I connect this to my industry or my expertise? Um, so you could do this in the grocery store, like, you know, you're grocery shopping, you're like, okay, a can of green beans, how can I connect this? What's the connection? And you kind of force yourself to find you know, those degrees of separation of how you could take a topic and make it apply to your audience, your industry, your products. Um, and that's where you see a lot of those posts, like, you know, 14 things we learned about, about you know, SEO from Jay-Z, or, you know, you yeah. see all these like oddball connections, that stuff is really compelling, but that's a good exercise to, to practice yeah. that skill. Like all green beans are not created equal people, right? There like, and which ones would you bring to the people that you love most? Definitely not the canned ones. You know, here we go. We're telling a story for you. So there if you, you do make a story about green beans, uh, make sure to tag uh, Melanie. We, we still got, we still got George here. We, we'll task George with, uh, he's got to tie the green beans and the manhole covers together somehow. So go. George, go. There you go. You could do the jackhammer approach, canned green beans, okay? You or, know what it is? The the lid of the green beans is also circular so that it doesn't fall into the into the can. And that's why manhole covers are circular. Maybe that works. There we go. All kinds of green bean stories. This is fun. This is a game I will be playing uh, with my team, actually. I think it's good. Once you use that side of your brain more often, it becomes, uh, I love this saying, what's what's uh, what fires together wires together. So the more mm -hmm. often you're using different parts of your brain, just something to remember, it's going to wire together and become less of an effort to get it to flow. Right. So yeah. definitely something to keep in mind. Now, Melanie, if people do have questions about their green bean stories or whatever else, <laughs> feedback on um, things that they read in your book because they want it and they're going to be commenting in the thread to get it, what's the best place for them to find you? 
So if you look for me on your social network of choice, you will find me, Melanie Diesel. I'm the only one of me, so so I'll pop up. Uh, look for the red lipstick. That's a good cue that it's me. Um, so you can find me there. Uh, my website is just mdiesel.com. Uh, so it's my first initial and last name. Uh, so you can find me there. And you know you could always feel free to reach out on social. I'm, I'm everywhere. And I'd love to, to point you in the direction of a resource or, or see if I can help. She's like the coolest chick. She's got the red <laughs> lipstick. She's always got the black shirt or leather jacket on. And her name is M. Diesel. Like, come on, people. Like, that's cool. But it's no, true. Melanie, thank you so much for your time. Sorry, Mike, go ahead. No, no. And I just want to remind everybody, just in case they don't win, um, Melanie's also offered that that code. So that was in the earlier comments, but it's uh, uh, code magnet for 20% off the book. So thank you again for that, Melanie, for those watching. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll get you 20% off the all the printable resources that are on the website. So we've got like uh, a call to action guide, uh, headline templates that you can use. There's a workbook for coming up with content ideas, all kinds of cool stuff. Okay. Thank you so much for providing so much value, not only in what you shared here, but extending that offer to the community so they can create better content in the future. And we can make the content web a lot better place for all of us to read better stories and, yeah. and connect with those. So, so much appreciate you sharing your wisdom here with us and our audience today. I really appreciate it. We'll, again, we'll be recapping this in a blog tomorrow. So if you do want that recap, just type recap in the comments and you'll be greeted with a messenger bot that will get you signed up and make sure you don't miss it. Until then, we'll be back here next Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Magnet Marketers. And I hope all of you enjoy the rest of your week. See you next week. Thanks, folks. Take care.